I think Sarah has something she wants to say. Uh, yeah, so let me just introduce it um, real quick. It'll take about two minutes. So, hello everyone. Welcome to our UU Virtual Roundtable. My name is Sarah Reyes and I will be today's moderator. Um, before we begin, I'd like to take the time to remind everyone that we are recording these sessions and we will be uploading them onto the UL UUCLC YouTube page. Um, so in case you just want to look, go back and look at these sessions, that will be available to you. Secondly, we ask that you remain muted during the presentation section as we will have a Q&A section afterwards. Um, at, and besides that, you know, please enjoy today's roundtable session. Okay, so um, I guess the bit, what, how, how many of you know Retake Our Democracy reasonably well? Oh, good. I'm not seeing many hands go up, which is always what I like to see because it means um, I'm reaching people, new people. Um, so I want to tell you a story of how it uh, sort of began. Um, uh, Roxanne and I, Roxanne Barber, my wife and I founded uh, Retake Our Democracy after spending two years um, coordinating the campaign for Bernie Sanders in northern New Mexico. And um, that didn't play out, but Deb Holland got us passes to go, to, and we decided we didn't want to be delegates to that love fest. And although, you know, I would have much preferred a love fest with uh, Hillary than the one we got. Um, and uh, but we, so we went to the convention and after the convention, we said to ourselves, you know, she's going to need to be pushed. Um, she's not as progressive as we would like, um, but um, she's going to, you know, she's going to need to be pushed. So we need to form an organization to give people an opportunity to voice their positions and channel them towards the new president. Uh, lo and behold, um, that fatal day, we discovered we weren't going to have to push. Um, and indeed, any pushing we might do in Washington was going to have no effect because um, Donald Trump really didn't care what we thought. And so we decided to shift and focus on New Mexico exclusively. And so that's what we've done. And our philosophy was that we really wanted to make it as easy as possible for people to become informed and then to take action. And so everything we've done has been um, focused around that. And, um, and we kind of, uh, and, and we had a built-in constituency from people who had supported Bernie but then when uh, Trump won, uh, the, we held a town hall uh, at 1420 Cerrillos uh, and almost immediately after the election. And we were hoping to get 100 people and build our momentum. And 600, 700 people showed up and uh, they were spilled out into the parking lot in the snow listening. Mm -hmm. And, and Roxanne and I kind of looked at each other and be careful what you wish for. What are we going to do? We can't coordinate 700 people. But we had, and ironically for this conversation, we had our next meeting at UU. And there we had three, 400 people, 350 people. And you know UU. It's not designed for that many people. And we did the best we could. But that was the launching point for our advocacy, both um, at the, at the roundhouse. Um, we had done some electioneering in 2016. We had supported Susan Herrera and Andrea Romero and had, you know, we don't really coordinate with campaigns. We just find out, you know, what they're about and here's your information. So you can go canvas, call, donate, whatever it is. Very simple, it's always right on the website and very easy to find. Um, and so we did that for those campaigns, and uh, we, we were lucky they won. Um, and, uh, and that started the process of changing the chemistry at the Roundhouse, because we analyzed and realized that if we were going to want to get good bills through, we couldn't have a Republican-held uh, House, and we couldn't have a Senate that was comprised of a lot of senators who were Democrats in name only. And so... But we started in 2017 at the Roundhouse, and we realized very quickly we didn't know what we were doing. We were in way over our heads. And while we were able to identify bills that sounded good and that we wanted to support, we really didn't understand the leverage points in the, in the Roundhouse and the process. And so we, when the session was over, 
we decided that we had to start to rely on allies, allies like Voices for Children, Common Cause, Planned Parenthood, um, those kinds of organizations who have been doing this kind of advocacy for decades in some cases. And so we learned from them and we published a report card on the 2017 legislative session that outlined how bills died. And we had come to, to identify how they die um, because almost all the Democrats had perfect scores on their voting record and yet half of our bills failed to pass. And the ways they passed or failed to pass was by being assigned to a committee and then that committee chair never hearing the bill and it just sat there until the session ended. And that happened over and over and over again. The only bill that really got voted down was the abortion decriminalization bill. So um, working from there, we, uh, um, uh, what did we do? We, we decided that uh, um, we, we, we created a statewide alert system. And I don't know if any of you are on it, but what we did was we identified bills and we developed one page summaries of the bills we supported and we identified the bills in collaboration and communication with um, other uh, ally groups. And then we would write one page summaries and we would have people at the roundhouse every day whenever one of our bills was in a committee for a hearing. And they would be standing outside with buttons and one page descriptions so that if you came down there, um, you would have something so that you could stand up and speak and, and forcefully in support of the bill. And um, while I spent almost all day, every day at the roundhouse, Roxanne was developing um, alerts that went out in the uh, emails in the mornings, every, every morning or every evening, sometimes late in the evening because the schedules weren't published in time. And those would send out and, and people would find out, you know, these are the bills that we are supporting that are being heard tomorrow, in these committees at this time, this room, and here's the contact information for your legislator, and here is your bill summary, which has speaking points. And so people were able to communicate with their legislators if they couldn't get to the roundhouse, and if they could get to the roundhouse, they'd be greeted by one of our coordinators outside the door. And that system worked very well. Um, and we had a good deal of success in 2019, but um, we also still feel what found um, a good many bills being killed by uh, Senate dinos. Um, we got things through the House over and over and over again, only to have them die in the Senate. And so we went after, um, we worked with Working Families Party, indivisibles throughout the state, tons of indivisibles, uh, Taos United, and a range of other grassroots organizations, PDA, Adelante Progressive Caucus. And we did what I had said we did with the uh, 2016 election. We had, I think we wound up having seven priority races, um, and almost all of them were in the Senate. And um, we, you know, posted information about how you can can't you can't canvas. So it was mostly calling and texting and donating. And um, the election, as it bore out in the primary, especially, um, you know, we re we were successful in removing John Arthur Smith, Clemente Sanchez, Mary Kay Papin, um, and a, and a host of uh, Gabe Ramos, um, Martinez. Um, and, and, and in doing so, we've substantially changed the chemistry in uh, the, the roundhouse. Um, and when I say we, I mean retake with a lot of partners, many of whom played a much larger role than we did. We did our best. Um, and that's, I would say, one of the lessons we're learning is that we're beginning to develop a, a much larger constituency and a much larger level of impact in the, in the, in the state. Um, and part of that is one of the silver linings of the uh, COVID, because when we would have meetings in Santa Fe to plan legislative action and recruit volunteers, we would get people from Santa Fe and maybe Taos and maybe Rio Reba, but cert and maybe a couple from Albuquerque, but nobody from southern, southern parts of the state, nobody from Silver City. I mean, who's going to come all that way for a meeting? And now we have Zoom and ours, and uh, uh, the last one we had was with Senator Peter Wirth and 
uh, Speaker Brian Egolf and, and Senate Pro Tem elect uh, Mimi Stewart, and we had 360 people on the Zoom. So, um, and they were from everywhere in the state. And so um, we're finding that through the use of Zoom, and we have, I'll talk more about some of our strategies for this session, um, where we're using Zoom to plan with people from throughout the state. Um, and to convene meetings with uh, senators all throughout the state. So um, that is um, basically how we got to 2021. Uh, we wrote a report card in 2019 that laid out what had happened in the Senate and the House and how bills died in the Senate. And then Eric Shimamoto, uh, I hope some of you have seen his video that I did with him about fixing the Senate, but it he really went into depth about how the most important decision made in the Senate was the selection of the pro tem. And so that's why we targeted um, uh, um, Mary Kay Papen um, in, in the election uh, as one of those races. And so here we are today. And we one of the things we're doing differently this year, we're gonna have the same alert system and I'll give you information on how to sign up for it and everything. Um, and um, but we're also focusing on far fewer bills. Last year we had like 63 bills and that was way too many to focus. And a, a long time ago, a friend of mine said, if you've got 60 to 100 priorities, you don't have priorities. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a difficult, difficult process, but we decided to break up our bill list between what we call transformational bills. And we have 15 of those and what we call priority bills. And we have about 28 of those, though that number is gonna grow as the uh, ses session begins. And so um, I'll show you what some of the bills are in just a second. But I, before I do, I wanted to mention that one of the observations Roxanne had was that she felt that very often, by the time legislators got to the roundhouse, they'd made up their mind. And so we felt like we needed to find a way to communicate with legislators much earlier. And the other thing we observed is, and this is something Peter Worth has told us over and over again, most legislators really don't care about people from Santa Fe, they care about their constituents. So we had to organize statewide. And what we've done is we have organized 27 teams, and those are teams are organized around Senate districts controlled by a Democrat. Because as I'd mentioned earlier, uh, in past sessions, what happens is they pass the, the bills pass the House and then they die in the Senate. And so we wanted to con communicate with senators earlier, and we organized teams. We've got coordinators in most of the teams, and um, we have anywhere from eight to 30, and in uh, Senator Worst district, we've got like 70 um, members of these teams. And um, the idea is we're scheduling Zoom and our, or Zoom meetings with those legis senators and their constituents. There's some next week, there's some Monday. Um, and, um, and that's where we're going to have these conversations between constituents and, and senators. And the purpose of these is not necessarily to try and convince them to vote for our bills. We want to ask them about our bills, and then we want to find out um, where they have concerns or where they're not sure they support the bill. And to illustrate how well this has worked, in our first Zoom was with uh, Mimi Stewart. And she really articulated um, uh, uh, a misunderstanding about what the Health Security Act was about and uh, a, a discomfort because she felt like we really need to understand more about the costs involved before we pull the tr trigger on this. Well, the structure of the Health Security Act this year is such that in the first year, um, the, uh, uh, they're convening a team to do um, uh, I think they call it a board, where they're gonna really work out every single nuance of how it's gonna function. And in doing that, they will be able to come up with a very precise determination of what the costs are. Now, there have been three studies done already that really articulate that you know it's gonna save the state money, but there wasn't enough um, clarity about exactly how it would be implemented. 
for that to give many legislators comfort. Well, when Senator Stewart expressed this concern and expressed her like, I don't know if I can go here just now, um, that was one of the people on the Zoom was a board member from Health Security Campaign for New Me Mexicans. And um, she got back to Senator Stewart, had a conversation with her. Um, I believe it was on a Zoom you did um, maybe a week ago, maybe two weeks ago um, that Stewart was on and someone asked her about the Health Security Act and I believe her comment was, I give up, I support it, I get it. <laughs> so um, the point of these Zoominars is these Zoom meetings is to find people's weaknesses, where they're confused, where they don't know uh, um, uh, how they feel on a bill. So let me just take this moment and I'm gonna to go to share screen. Oh, before I do that, give me just one second here so I can get to the right place. Sorry about that. Should have had this up and ready. Okay, so now I come back here, share screen. Okay, you should be able to see our website and um, you'll see that we have a menu across here. And under legislation, we have our strategy, which I more or less describe. We have a toolkit, which I just wanna give you a quick tour. This is, um, gives you um, the link to the bills we support, our strategy, um, the, the role of a Senate district advocacy team coordinator, the role of a team member, how to identify your Senate district and your Senator, how to identify your House district and your Senator, contact information for all Democratic Senators, 27 Democratic Senators, and this is off of their um, campaign registration information. So it has their cell phone numbers and their home addresses. And so you can write to them, you can call them more easily. The information on NM Legis on the legislative site is not nearly as detailed as this. And, and they don't look at their NM Legis emails in the, um, when they're not in session. So now you can reach them. Then, then we wanted people to be able to do things like organize teams. So we put together uh, guides with screenshots for how to do a doodle poll, because some people maybe have never done it, and how to organize a Zoom meeting, because some people have never done it. They may have participated, but organizing it and setting it up and sending it out, they may not have that capacity. And then we put together a media guide, which interestingly includes just not just uh, a, a guide for how to do a letter to the editor and some sample letters, but then also contact information for all of these different newspapers so that people from throughout the state could make uh, uh, could send in letters to the editor and so forth. And then the other thing we had here is oh, we had uh, we have a list of our scheduled Zoom conversations and I have to update that. That's with senators. And then here is our bills. And um, if you click here, you get you know, just a list of the bills, abortion decriminalization is our top priority bill, but we also don't expect to have to spend any time on it whatsoever. And you'll see that there's a brief summary of what it is, but then there's a, you click here and you go to a one page description of the bill and speaking points and the history of what happened last time. Um, so all of that information is on our bill list and we'll just take a second to, to go over the, the, the bill list, uh, let me just go back here. And so the Health Security Act is one and all the ones that have a blue link have a one pager associated with it. Um, the Public Bank for New Mexico, Local Choice Energy, and you'll have the whole second half of this conversation to ask me questions about any and all of these bills. Um, the Green Amendment, the Permanent Fund for Early Childhood Education, Comprehensive tax reform, and that one pager you'll see is not quite ready. It will be ready probably tomorrow. Expanding the working families tax credit, oil and gas bonding increase, and the reason we don't have a one pager for that yet is it's looking like it will not be introduced this year. Water, our Governance Reform Act, I have a conversation with um, 
uh, Melanie Stansberry, who's the sponsor for, uh, I'll be talking to her later today, to get the final gist on that. Paid sick leave, um, small loan interest cap reduction, Energy Transition Act, and that will have the one pager up. In fact, it is up. It's just the link hasn't been created here. And uh, marijuana legalization and a food and ag omnibus bill. And I don't want to go through this list, but it's there for you to take a look at. These are all the other bills that we're going to be looking at for the uh, um, 2021 session. And while we won't be sending out alerts for all of those bills, we will be building more, more robust summaries for each and encouraging people if they find any of these bills to be um, uh, particularly germane to them and meaningful to them, to, we'll be providing support for how you can um, advocate for those bills. We just won't be sending out alerts um, on all of them. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is we created a survey. We did a survey in 2018, and um, uh, it's right here in the home homepage here. You click on it, and you go to this page, which is a waste of time, and then you just click here, and you're at our survey. And the survey asks you, you know, a whole series of questions. You don't have to give your name. It's confidential. We've had about a thousand people complete it, but it has all 27 of our bills listed in the survey. And um, I think I can show you, yeah, it's got all the bills listed and you, you put in your Senate district. And so we know how many people we have in each Senate district. And um, I'm gonna move this over here. And how many people responded in each Senate and House district and then, scroll, 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 and abortion decriminalization. And you can see the number of people so far who had that as their absolute top priority and how many had uh, health security and so forth. And we can break this out by Senate district. So we can do a filter over here and um, uh, tell a legislator exactly how many of his constituents had completed the poll and where they stand on each of our bills. So, um, you know, that's, that's one little bit of our, uh, um, are you still able to see everything I'm doing here? Somebody yes. nod. Yes. Okay, so one last thing I wanted to show you on our website and that's in our resources menu. And again, the whole concept is to make it easier for you. So we have, again, the media kit, but we have a list of agencies we recommend people to write, uh, to donate to, reliable reading sources, an inventory of video, um, contact information for the U.S. Senators and House reps, uh, contact information for PRC members, uh, and um, for the city and, uh, and county of Santa Fe, and the public education department and just other things, you know, a Senate map and a house map. So just a lot of different tools there that can make it easier for you if you want to be advocating. And so now I'm gonna go back and um, move you guys over here so I can stop the share. And, you know, we've got five more minutes before we're supposed to go into the, uh, uh, Q and A, but um, I'm good with doing questions and answers now. Um, uh, I, I think I've more or less covered most of what we do. I, uh, one other thing I would like to share, and that is, the focus lately has been on transformation. Um, those that's those bills, and so we've been examining um, um, democratic socialism. This last week, we've had I think five articles about democratic socialism. And we're trying to help people understand that there are a lot of myths about democratic socialism and, that, and, may, and maybe many of you understand this, so I'm preaching to the choir, but because uh, I'm seeing heads nodding. Um, but um, we're, we've been having some very interesting discussions and part of the concept of doing our blog was always supposed to be that people comment on it and we get a rich dialogue going. And that didn't really percolate very well for a couple of years, and in the last year or so, it has. And so after, the, after a blog's been up for a few days, you'll find like a series of comments, and some of them from some extraordinarily um, bright people who uh, debate what, what has been discussed. And the point of all this is 
we want people to start to understand better how to um, change things. And to do that, you have to understand the things you're trying to change and why. And so um, one of the things that evolved out of that was the creation of what we call a transformation study group, which is right now about 10 or 12 people. And initially the whole point of it was that each person or maybe in some cases two people working together would work on a brief on a particular area of policy um, that uh, espoused um, a transformational strategy, something that's not like just increased minimum wage by $2, but something about like the universal basic income. That is a, a, a big change that people kind of, you can't just give money to people. Um, and, um, you know, other kinds of, of, of policies that, and the most, the first completed policy brief was on um, tax and revenue reform. And so um, this group meets every other week uh, by Zoom. And again, this is the power of Zoom because some of these people live in Albuquerque, some live in Las Cruces. Um, and so we meet and what has evolved out of that is not so much that the writing of the briefs, but the, the rich one hour conversations we have with each other every other week. They're really, really interesting people. We're becoming friends. And we're learning a lot because we cover different topics. Sometimes we don't talk about the transformation study groups, st study uh, areas at all. Um, most recently, we've been talking about Georgia, for example. So, um, uh, which is, if you read today's blog, you'll see that there's a new poll showing, um, the last three polls in a row are, are very good news for Democrats. So, um, and so for example, another thing in terms of making it easier for people, under the election menu in the, in the banner, we have a page of strategies. You click on that and there's all kinds of strategies. If you like to text for candidates, here, click here. If you like to make phone calls, click here. If you want to donate for this campaign, click here. And it's all focused on Georgia. Um, and so uh, that's, that's Retake Our Democracy and what we've been trying to do for the last few years. And uh, um, we're looking forward to the 2021 legislative session. And I hope some of you um, decide to sign up. Oh, wait, let me do a share screen again one more time and just show you that uh, where to do that. Right here, subscribe to the blog, get action alerts. You click here and you give us your name and, and you're in, in the system and, you, and, and your Senate district. And we're gonna revise, this is a new feature of this page here. We've got to put in a link here to, to so that if you don't know your Senate district, um, you can uh, you can find it in one click. So um, that's it. I'm open to questions. I just like to uh, you are very good by the way. Yes, um, I, the democratic socialism, and I've traveled uh, a lot around the world, and especially in northern uh, Europe and so forth, and. And they, you know, they have very capitalistic economies. But, for example, even in the, uh, the Senate races in Georgia, all the the Democratic opposite, the Republicans, all they're talking about is socialism, socialism, socialism. And so, uh, how do you, you know, uh, it can it's not going to take, you know, the government's not going to run everything. But I'm just curious, how do you describe democratic socialism? Well, you know, and it's, it's fascinating. Like I told you, like we're starting to get comments. Well, one of the comments was somebody, Mick Nickel, um, just spent, I don't know how much time, but he got definition after definition after definition of individualism, neoliberalism, socialism, capitalism, Marxism, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, just, just kind of try and make it clear what we're talking about. And so, but there are different definitions. And we had another person, William Finoff, write a lengthy comment say, you know, talking about, you know, that, that socialism has spawned all kinds of dictatorial um, regimes that have not exactly been um, positive. And so um, uh, what we've been discussing in the blog um, I think four of them this week have been about this. Um, 
has been that, you know, there are different ways to define things. Democratic socialism, I would say, has never really been fully implemented um, and in, in any kind of a large scale. And that um, in most of the places that William Finoff was pointing out that it has spawned dictatorships, it was maybe government control, but it certainly wasn't so democratic. Certainly, it wasn't socialism, I would argue, but it certainly wasn't democratic socialism. And so the, the missing piece for, for um, uh, effectively implementing uh, something that had um, more justice to it is the democratic part of that. And for example, and, and, and not necessarily run by government. Um, uh, you know, the, one of the things we write about and talk about are uh, uh, the ca Canadian model of health security. Um, yeah. or a single payer. Um, it's not government run like it is in England. It's privately run, but it's, it's uh, publicly managed and insured. And, um, and so, you know, that's a different model. And then democratic socialism can also incorporate structures like worker co-ops, where it's not like government runs every single industry, but workers have a seat at the table and manage um, equally mm -hmm. the, the bit the, the place they work. I mean, one of the terms used by Marx is that um, uh, the people have um, control of the means of production. Well, that isn't necessarily created if the government has control. I mean, they're not necessarily any more benevolent or have any better understanding of how work works than workers do. And so I, I would say that's, that's part of our definition is that you know, in, it, it's got to incorporate really strong democratic structures because this, as soon as you give government control of too much, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely, mm -hmm. and um, and that that's what you wind up with. Yeah. Any anyone else have a question or comment? Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I would. Uh, Paul, thank you very much. This is Dave Rice. I appreciate your work. This is really impressive. Um, you'd mentioned, for example, on various issues, you've got, say, 25 issues. And for a, for a given senator, you can say, well, these people from your district, this is how they stack up as far as supporting your issues. And you pointed out, like, the decriminalization of abortion is a highly popular topic. But a lot of other ones weren't. Um, do you sometimes use that tool to identify areas that the group has to reinforce so that more members support a topic? Right, that's a great question. Um, one, but you know, one of the ways, um, and maybe I'll go back to that survey with the shared screen to show you, but we put it together two ways. One was how strongly do you support a bill? And there you can strongly support a bill and strongly support the next bill and the next yeah. bill. Yeah. Um, and then we made them rank them. And we said, and at first it was going to be, give us just your first three bills. But we had a hunch, and I think we were right, that abortion decrim, health security were going to be one, two. And then it was going to be like, you really got one priority then. <laughs> <laughs> so we made it, I think it was, it's eight out of 15. And that way, we, you know, if we made it all 15, it would have been like mind-numbingly difficult to do, just logistically to kind of, where, where am I now? But eight was okay, and it fit across the page. And as a result of that, we're able to take a look at both, uh, through both lenses. And so, um, for example, almost no one uh, 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 opposes um, reducing the uh, predatory lending rate. But it, it is almost no one's first, second, or third priority. So if you just go by ranking, it falls way down. But if you actually look at, whereas abortion has probably more strongly opposed than any other bill. Um, and um, that's because we're reaching out to rural communities. We're not just polling in Santa Fe. And we had like, I think 18 or 20 Republicans who have taken the poll. And that's a good thing, because we want to see how 
the Republican, we would like to penetrate further in those uh, communities, um, and especially in those rural communities. I mean, one of the things Roxanne and I did after the 2017 session um, was go on a tour of the state because one of the things we were critiqued for was that our bills tend to, no, this is after the 2019 session, um, was that we were too focused on what they called Albuquerque, Santa Fe centric, you know, things. And so there wasn't something in there about rural libraries, uh, trapping. Um, and actually that was after the 2017 session um, because we had trapping and we had a, book, a, a bill about rural libraries in the subsequent session. And you'll see that we have a food and ag bill in the uh, uh, bills this year. We, were, we had a bill in our top priorities for uh, infrastructure uh, uh, in uh, rural communities and, and tribal communities until we found out more about it. And it's just to set up an agency to basically plan for having uh, um, a, a more robust or any infrastructure in rural and tribal communities. And we just sort of felt like um, rather than actually doing something and putting money into it, we were, um, you know, creating an agency so that we could say we got something done. So um, uh, that we are using the uh, survey to see where there is an absence of support. And in some instances, um, we find that there's a reason for it and that maybe we need to rethink our priorities. And in other instances, um, it's more a function of, okay, now we know where we need to do education because people don't really see this as a priority and they really should. Um, and, and you know, the, the thing that's important to realize is the bills aren't, it's not like Roxanne and I sit here for a few weeks and go, okay, here's our 15 bills. It's like I spend most of my day on the phone with people from New Mexico Voices, from Common Cause, from a whole range of indivisible people um, and legislators and find out what, um, what bills are, um, uh, are percolating and how, how impactful they might be. And, um, and, and one of our priorities for when we select bills um, is that we pick bills that we feel will, are not a hopeless cause, like they're not going to pass, period, no matter how much we work on them, but also not slam dunks. And we almost didn't include abortion decriminalization among our priorities because we haven't found anybody in the legislature who's Democrat who's opposed it's gonna pass, it's gonna pass in the first week probably. And so, um, uh, you know, but at the same time, we didn't wanna have it on our list and have all we'd be dealing with was people going, well, wait a minute, how come you, you don't care about a woman's right to choose? And so, um, and we had board members who were adamant that that had to be at the top of the list. So, um, but yeah, the survey helps with that. And, uh, and it also helps legislators. Um, and some legislators have taken the, the survey uh, less than we would like. Um, one of the compromises we had to do by um, accelerating and being more proactive in our advocacy around bills is there's no bills yet. So, you know, we have, you know, one pagers and summaries based on what we've learned about what's going to be in the bill. And like today, I got the very first actual bill language of a bill, the uh, Energy Transition Act. And so I, I, I know exactly what that bill is going to look like now. Um, and that's a, an amendment to the Energy Transition Act. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's how we use that information. Thank you very uh, much. Well, well, yes, go ahead, uh, uh, Rosa. I want to keep it short, Rosa. <laughs> Yeah, um, I usually take a lot of notes. So first of all, um, Paul, I, I really want to congratulate you and your wife, Roxanne, for the great job that you're doing and for selecting mm -hmm. um, to um, focus on inform or educate not only constituents, residents, but also uh, elected officials. I have worked with a couple of el elected officials in my life, and I know uh, they don't seem to know everything that people think they know. So I'm very happy. 
I'm also very happy to know that um, that you learn on your experience that elected officials don't listen to people in Santa Fe. I'm very happy about it because I live in Las Cruces and I would prefer for people to be, you know, checking on, on their constituents instead of just the people that are there in Santa Fe. The other thing that I wanna tell you is that I'm, I'm surprised uh, that on the survey that you did, I would like to know about the demographics because lots of times uh, Latinas, for example, don't participate on those surveys. So I, I always, when people say, oh, uh, we have a survey, you know, studies shown consistently that Hispanics don't participate, you know, on surveys. So I will be concerned with some of them. I also learned on looking through your website that both of you, uh, you and your wife raise children as single parents, which is great. I did that myself, but I don't find childcare in many of the list of priorities everywhere. And I did a, a very basic research as somebody that just moved here uh, to Las Cruces a year ago. And I learned that in, in 2019, there were four bills that addressed child care. And in, in 2020, there were only three bills. And the bills, for the most part, have been actually led by a Republican elected official female and by a couple of... Um, Democrats. So that means that something that I'm very interested in is that I'm going to be probably working with them to, to try to support them. The other thing that I want to let you know is that um, I noticed that, that in your board, you don't have any Latinas. You do have three Hispanics there, and you have four males and three women, which is great. But remember that in New Mexico, there's, uh, what is it, 49% Hispanics, and you know, 55% of them are Hispanic females. So it would be good to have a Latina or a couple of Latinas included on your board because there's only seven there, so you can expand it. Now, my question is, given that we are in a state that is in such a large number of Hispanics, have you considered on doing some Spanish translation of some of the key documents on your website? Because uh, one of the things that I'm finding, and it's nationwide, the Democratic Party has actually neglected um, really work on the rural areas and, and in Hispanics. And as somebody that, like I said, that I just moved here, and I'm planning probably on staying here at least for 10 years, I'm going to be focusing on, on precisely those two groups, rural as well as Hispanics, because okay. Democrats, over and over, by every statistics that I read, uh, Republicans are doing much better, not only in registering, but also mm. reaching out to those two groups that I think Democrats should pay more attention to. So um, I want to uh, get response from you. What do you think about my recommendations? Okay. So um, uh, there are several, so um, I'll, I'll try. Yes. <laughs> um, in terms of, I always uh, take notes, by the way. In, in terms of our board, we had two other uh, uh, female uh, board members who were uh, from the Navajo Nation, and they had to step down when COVID hit because they are leading the Hopi Navajo uh, COVID Relief Fund in, uh, in Navajo Nation. And so they hopefully once this uh, pandemic is over, they'll be joining the board. That'll give us a, a, an additional two women. Um, and uh, and we really wanted to keep the board small because um, because we just do. Um, we just you know one of the things I was going to note about retake is one of the things I hope is a takeaway for all of you is Roxanne and I never had any advocacy organizing experience at all before we were sitting at the dining room table listening to bernie sanders announce his candidacy and we said we got to do this and we didn't even know what this was at that moment but yes. we started organizing meetings and so we were uh, we learned to organize and so i guess the takeaway for me here is if we can do this 
others can do this. And if they can't necessarily devote the amount of time, um, and you know, I, for 25 years, I was a federal grant writer, so I know how to write. So I was, cool. I, you know, it's for me to do mm -hmm. blogs. And well, Roxanne me. is, what, excuse, hold on one second. Let me just answer yes. your questions and then you can uh, chime in. Um, and Roxanne was a communications director for a national nonprofit, the National Writing Project. So she knows how to edit and design. So we have some, a skill set, but we also, yes. all it really is, is time. And anybody can do that. And, and that's part of the retake approach is to make it easier and then to motivate you through the blog and, and, and to get people to take uh, on larger roles in advocacy. Um, you had mentioned that the, the, the bill list doesn't include much about um, childhood, but the Early Childhood Education Permanent Fund is a huge bill for early childhood and no, child care. I'm just talking about child care. Well, the, the, it's early starting at three years old. It's free child care, essentially. And it's not just child care. It's, it's child development child care so that it's professionally staffed. And so, um, no, we don't have a child care bill this year because we haven't heard anything about it. And as we do hear about it, we will certainly consider it. Um, and in terms of uh, translating into Spanish, we just don't have the capacity. We looked into it. We have a board member, Miguel um, um, Acosta, who, who was hooked us up with a translator. Um, it was like $75 a page. And he, it was like every two weeks, it would take two weeks to turn something around. And, and we had done some translation with uh, the Bernie Sanders campaign. And it turned out that the person who was translating well, it wasn't exactly in the vernacular of conversational Spanish. It's much more academic Spanish. And, it, and so it wasn't really as engaging as we had hoped. So it's just, an, it, there's absolutely no question that there's a need for that. Um, but there's also um, uh, other Spanish organizations that are able to do that more easily than we are. Yucca has a lot of their, and Earthcare has a lot of their information in both languages, SOMOS does. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, it's just, that's a niche we can't fill, at least at this point in time. As for your comments about rural um, and Democrats not paying attention to them, I couldn't agree more. And uh, one of the things we're involved in is the Adelante Progressive Caucus. And there's going to be an election. We darn near took over the Democratic Party and won the majority in the state steering committee, um, of which Roxanne and I are members, and many retake people are members. Kathy Wooten's in here somewhere. I saw her mm -hmm. flower in her hair. Um, and uh, she's on the state central committee and with Adelante. And our intent is to do that because part of what we want to do is instead of the Democratic Party being a fundraising mechanism only, essentially, and all you do is get emails about opportunities to go and spend $250 to virtually have lunch with so-and-so, um, we want to go out, and, and rather than gerrymandering District 2 into becoming a, uh, a blue district, an easily blue district, we want to educate, engage, and motivate in those communities so that they understand that the Democratic Party better serves their uh, priorities. And so that's a big part of what we're um, going to be doing. Actually, unfortunately, it, that those elections are happening while we're in the legislative session. So it's going to be a lot of balls in the air. But we, we really want to try and um, get a majority in the, uh, in the state central committee and so forth so we can start directing the Democratic Party to do more grassroots um, uh, mm -hmm. canvassing and conversations with people um, mm -hmm. in between elections, not just before elections. Uh, Rosa, just, yeah. let somebody else come in. Yeah, I, I just want to say something real fast. I'm interested in helping on that translation call, okay? And I'm okay. sure other people will be interested in helping you because we want more of those services and support um, resources addressing the, the southern part of New Mexico. Okay, Rosa, okay. Well, I, I really think we need to hear from others now. Are there yeah, other yeah, go yes. ahead. Uh, who else? Uh, Jane, you want to talk? I'm good. I'm listening at the moment. Rosemary, how about Rosemary? 
<laughs> yes. Can, um, first of all, Paul, thank you so much for all your time and efforts. Truly appreciate this. It's been very informative. Have to apologize. Had to uh, run out for just a, a few minutes, so I missed quite a bit of the presentation. But and in the very beginning, you said you were Zooming with some of the, the legislators, uh, specifically some of the senators. Will you be Zooming in with uh, Cervantes or the newly elected senator? For, I'm from Las Cruces. Um, Carrie yep, Hamlin? From Las Cruces. <laughs> yes, um, we have a team down there. We have teams in Las Cruces. And part of the, the tour that Roxanne and I did is we twice came to the uh, PVA down in Las Cruces and spoke to those groups. Um, but um, uh, yes, we have, we have teams forming and on our homepage, if you look at the banner at, at the top of the homepage at retakeourdemocracy.org, um, it has a thing where you can click to sign up for um, a Senate district team. And, and so we wanna have conversations. I, we don't have, as, it's actually kind of surprising um, we don't have as many people in Las Cruces as we have thought would have thought, given that there are a large number of people um, from Las Cruces who are on our alert system. But we have not been as effective as we would like to engage um, people for, uh, I think we have a significant number for Bill Sewells and Carrie Hamlin, but not very many for Cervantes and surprisingly not. Many Steinberg, we're not going to need to push very hard, so we're not that worried about it. Yeah. And one of the things we're going to try and do, and um, I have to get an email out about this today, um, is to try and have in January, early, we're in January. I, think. <laughs> I, keep, I keep saying when we get to January, and it's like, hey, we're there. Um, uh, we're going to have a uh, uh, hopefully a Zoom with all nine of the new legislators. That'll include seven new senators and two new House members who are Democrats. And um, the purpose of that will be to explore with them, like, what are you concerned about? What are you unclear on? A lot of these people are well-intentioned. And, you know, somebody else had made a comment about they don't, these legislators don't necessarily know everything about these bills. And you know, it, think about it. They've got 2,000 bills to pay attention to. Some of them are 80 pages and they don't have any staff. So um, that's part of the purpose of our one pagers is they can get it in one page. This is what it's about. And over time, um, legislators on both sides of the aisles are learning they can trust our one pagers to be fact based. Now, Republicans may object to those facts and may use it um, to vote against the bills, but they at least see we distill things fairly. And so that's been a, uh, a useful uh, tool. Bob Libby, would you like to make the, a comment? I think he's on here and I know he, he is. He he's is. the representative down here. Yes, I'm here. Hello, I'm here. Mm. So, yeah, go ahead, Bob. You have a team to uh, have a Zoom meeting with Bill Souls. Right now we have about eight people on our team. We would be interested. We have some very good high quality people on there and we would like to have more people. So I just sent out a chat. If you want to send me an email, um, we'd be happy to have you join our team and we're going to be talking to Bill, who uh, I think will be a pretty easy talk really because I think he supports yeah. most of these bills already. Yeah. But, um, it, I, I think the strength in numbers and it would be good maybe to have another eight people on there. So I and part of what we want to try and achieve in these things, Bob, and you, you know this, of course, is, um, you know, if you're strongly in favor of the Health Security Act, we want you not just to vote for it, but to go and talk to Senator Worth and to Senator Stewart and make darn sure that they, they, the, the, the committee path makes sense and is passable for any of the bills that they strongly support. And Bill has been a really strong, I, I suspect he's gonna be a very helpful advocate on the ETA yes. amendment as well. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. see, is it Dave Steele or DA? Oh, Dave Steele, go ahead, Dave, go ahead. You gotta unmute. 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 There, there you go. go. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> 
Now, I, I was just wondering uh, what uh, your group's position is on uh, advocating for a paid uh, legislature. Yeah. Oh, strongly in favor of Good. it. Strongly right. in favor of it. I haven't seen okay. that the bill is being introduced this session. Um, it's a real tough push because it's been introduced before and voted down by the voters. Um, and, you know, there's just a lot of people who feel like if government doesn't work, why should we pay anybody to manage it? Um, and, you know, that's a legacy of, of the Reagan era. And that's something we've been talking a lot about in the blog is that uh, this last week when we've been talking about socialism, because part of the deal there is, you know, people have this sense that, you know, the last thing you want is government to try and do anything for you. Yet the most popular program in the, in the country is social security, which is government doing something right. for you. And it's unemployment and it's roads yeah. and it's police and it's, you know, all of these fire departments. Um, and so, uh, right. uh, you know, part of the myth we're trying to demystify is that government can't do anything for you. But if government's gonna do for you, you need to pay people um, to be able to, to, to serve in the legislature and give them staffs. And it, it, not only would that make them more competent, it would make it easier for the legislature to look like New Mexico. Um, you know, right now, you've got to be wealthy, retired, a lawyer, or in a job that allows you to, you know, take time off to do this. Yep. And um, uh, we just had one House of Re House member elected this time, uh, Brittany Barreras, who's, uh, you know, a single mom and works selling cell phones in a store. It's like a person with a real job in a real community working on on real issues has a, a, a much better understanding of the rigors and challenges faced by working families. Um, so, I know that uh, uh, Sarah wants to cut in here. We're getting to our time, but I just want to follow right. up on in regard to paying people. You know, I worked for the World Bank for about 12 years, and one of the first things we did when we provide a loan to a country is that we sit, they, uh, we insist that they pay their civil servants a decent salary, or otherwise they're going to be corrupt. I mean, right. it's, it's automatic. <laughs> if, right. if, if, you, if you don't pay people a decent salary, yep. they're going to be corrupt. It, it, yeah. it happens all the time. All you got to do is go to Mexico, and, and that's, you'll see it again and again and again. So you got to pay people a decent salary. Are they all corrupt the responsibility they have? Mm -hmm. Anybody else got a comment? Go ahead, Jane. I just want to say to Paul, thank you so much uh, for this presentation today. It has been so enlightening. And I have been watching the group for a long time. Uh, I have a job right now that I won't be done with until September. And uh, I look forward to becoming more engaged with uh, Retake Our Democracy. And I do mm -hmm. want to also say to you that if Rosa Morales volunteers to do a job for you, you can count on it. It will get done. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> Very good. Well, okay. Well, uh, let's. Oh, I want to just announce who next week. And then. Uh, uh, Jeff Anderson and myself, and I'm hoping to get somebody from the Department of Agriculture, uh, uh, the Department of Agriculture, to talk about the potential of hemp in New Mexico. And uh, anyway, it's a new crop, and it has a lot of potential. It's been associated with marijuana for far too long, but uh, it has a lot of other uses, and I think it would help our rural areas particularly. Didn't and, agree uh, more. And that? do you agree with that? I totally agree, and I just wanted to make sure. One thing, you know, you know, I give you a tour of the website. I better give you the retake uh, website URL. It's a retakeourdemocracy.org, and so go and take your own tour and see what you find there. And then, if you like it, sign up. There's a subscribe button on the right, and then uh, maybe take a look at some of the things we did this week because uh, I, I think it's pretty interesting conversation right now about democratic socialism. And I want to so thank anyway, thanks you. everybody. Thank you, Paul. You, thank you, everyone. Great Have a great resource. afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you.